If you have your Bibles, you might want to read along with me. Um, and I'm going to begin in Acts uh, chapter 7. And I'm going to begin at, at uh, verse 54. And this is the beginning of the evangelism and outreach of the church. This is the beginning. As I was talking with Gordy there, we want to make certain that you folks understand that this is not some kind of a uh, social justice, some kind of a poverty, some kind of a economic development idea, that this is some kind of a uh, programmatic stuff, CCDA. What CCDA wants to do is live out the word of God that we are responding to the Apostle James who says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Because if you be just a hearer of the word and not a doer, you deceive yourself and you can accommodate all kind of injustice because you're deceived. And so the church has been deceived. They have been hearers of the word and not trying to do it. The Bible is a textbook for living out God's faith here on earth. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is not necessarily a scientific book. It is not necessarily a psychological counseling book. It is not a political book. It's a book about God's people doing the work of God here on earth. Faith without works is dead. And so this is not some thought up liberal conservative trying to adjust Christianity to our political social views. The idea of what we are trying to do is to let God be true and that we get our marching orders from God and that we keep Jesus as our great shepherd. We never lower it down and make a human being like me and others the chief shepherd. He is the shepherd of our soul. What well, we are the under shepherd. God and his flock, they don't belong to us. They belong to him. And the church don't belong to us. This ain't no my church. This is Christ's church. He gave himself for it. He sacrificed himself for the church. We are doing all that we can to try to guide you into the great shepherd, to the great shepherd who can lead us and who can guide us. I want you to understand that we are so uh, confused, the church, and we are so personality cult confused You in, in society. The, the big person in all of this is the resurrected Savior. Resurrect the Savior. I want you to know that. I want you to know that. And, and, and God. So this is the beginning of the outreach of the church. The church had been born at Pentecost. They needed an outreach sort of a person who could be their outreach chairman of the deacon boy. And they got this scholarly, scholarly guy named Stephen. He was an absolute scholar. You got to read his sermon. It's one of the most profound sermons in the pages of Scripture. You, you know. And so now they have brought him before the council and they have questioned him, and he done gave this wonderful sermon. And we're going to see a guy named Saul and his bunch guide him. We're going to see him drag him out of the temple, and they're going to carry him out. Out of the city. They ain't going to spill his blood in the city. They're going to carry him out on the garbage pit where they carry Jesus. That's where they're going to stone him at, on the garbage pit, outside of the gate. And that's going to be the beginning of the outreach of the church. 
because this madman saw this original Osama bin Laden is going to take care of that. He's going to make certain that the church get outreach because he's going to get them out of Jerusalem. He's going to get them out of Jerusalem. And the church now is going to begin to blossom all over the world. So let's listen at this passage. This is a very historical, uh, orthodox. We are orthodox. We are going back to our founding fathers of the church. This is not some new age junk. We're going back. This is orthodox. As you can get, I just don't have on the rope. Uh, I should have borrowed Sh- Shane's robe this morning. <laughs> So you would know we look like orthodox. <laughs> Going back. Okay, let me, let's go here. Wait, let's go back to our teaching. <laughs> when they heard these things, Stephen's speech, they was cut to the heart, and they gashed upon him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfast into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father and said, this is what Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right side of God. Then they, the murderers, cried out with a loud voice, stopped up their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city to the garbage pit and stoned him. And they laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul, who had given orders to do this. This murder, this murder here has given orders to do this. And they stoned Stephen. And Stephen was calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. Oh, Lord. He could have said, Father, forgive him. Could have said, Father, forgive him. But he said that. He said, lay not this sin to their charge. And then he fell asleep. And Saul was consenting. Saul was doing all that he could do to kill as many as he could. He's consenting until he's going to meet his death on the Damascus Road. He was consenting until his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution of the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were scattered among them throughout the region and Judea in every place. Let me go to another passage here. This passage here. Chapter 9. Let's skip over to chapter 9 here of Acts 1. And saw yet Cursing, mad with the church. It says, breathing out, threatening, and slaughter. That's where we get the idea of manslaughter from. He's killing people. That's what he's doing. He's a, he is trying to remove all Gentile influence upon Judaism. That's what the Pharisee was. They had it together, all together. They had all truth, and there was no other truth but their truth. They're the one who had just put to death the Son of God from heaven. So this Saul, Pharisee of the Pharisees, he said that is breathing out slaughter against the church and against the disciples. And he went into the high priest 
and desired of him a letter from the synagogue that if he found any following this so-called way, this Jesus way, whether they were men or women, it could have said boys or girls, boys or girls. Anything that got in his way was slaughtered. Got in his way was slaughtered. Look what happened. What happened? He found in that way, whether they were men and women, he was going to bound them and bring them to Jerusalem and kill them. And he journeyed nearer Damascus. And suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth. And he heard a voice saying unto him, Saw, saw, why you persecute me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It is hard for you to go on kicking against me, kicking against the priest. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it be told you there what you must do. Arise, go into the city, and it's going to be told you what to do. How can we, within CCDA, be more effective urban workers. That's where our crisis is at. They're all over, but people are still coming to the cities, and the cities are growing, and we need to take over the city, and we were trying to build a movement as fast as we can, fast as we can, to reach the rural. And you're going to be hearing more about it. And we're going to be asking y'all to help us. Help us. We're not going to be ashamed. We're not going to be ashamed. We're not going to leave those people out there to, to be to see that neglect, and I'm seeing it in the Mississippi Delta. I'm seeing that neglect becoming a slight pathological uh, sort of a uh, a germ that is spreading out in the rural. It's undermining those old rural values that are there because the people are so neglected. They are not getting pastors out there because pastors are not going there. Pastors are not going out there pastor those churches of, uh, of, of, of 25 people that's not going to grow no more than 25 people. In fact, it's going to go down to 22 people. They're not going to grow. You know, and so they don't have good pastors out there. They don't have intelligence. They don't have young men like these men here on here. We don't have young youth leaders out there. They are being neglected out there. We're going to help them. We're going to help them. We're not going to leave them behind as we take on the city. As we take on the city, we're not going to leave them alone. We're not going to leave them behind. There. And so, how can we be then, I'm going to get to my teaching, how can we be then more effective urban workers? And I like so much what Shane said last night. We got to imagine things better. I like that song, Imagine. You got to imagine that things can be better. You got to imagine. You got to dream. Dream. So how can we be more effective urban workers? I'm going to liken it today as going down three roads. You've probably heard this before, but this is the same as the three R's. You're not going to stop having this sermon. If you come back next year, you'll hear the same sermon again. So I want you to understand that. We, we, this is planned. This is planned. This is not entertainment Christianity. We had that last night. We, it was good. This is not entertainment here. This here here is practical application of the teaching of Jesus to our everyday life. So as we leave here, we can go out there and be these effective urban workers. Amen. I'm going to liken it to going down three roads. So to be an effective Christian worker, you've got to imagine that you are going down three roads. 
and you're going down all of these three roads at the same time. You got the idea? All of these three roads, you're on a freeway that has three lanes, you're going to one destination. They're not going to three different places. They're going to one destination, and you got three lanes, and in order to get there, you got to navigate these three lanes. You know the Christian life is called a road, it's called a walk, it's called a path in life. Broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many find it. Narrow is the road that leads to life, and few get in that path. And so it's a road, it's a walk, it's a way, it's a path as we go down. And so the first road we want to go down this morning is the Damascus Road. The Damascus Road. This is the road of conversion. You've got to understand that. You don't altogether inherit Christianity. You, you hear what it's about and all of that, but you don't quite inherit this life. Faith brings this life. We are born again by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not an inheritance. Not an inheritance. The people can pass on all those good virtues and nurture, and the family should do that. The family should nurture us in love in a way that they can know what love is, and they can long for it, and they can find this deep love in Jesus Christ. They can know about love, know about love. People are lost who don't know about love. One of the break, big things in the criminal justice system, these kids growing up without a man, and the, the greatest longing that any human being has is the acceptance of his father. That's a great longing. That's a great longing. And so the father needs to be there in order to affirm that longing. That builds a foundation on which we now can move out in life. We can be successful. We can learn our ABCs, and we can learn math, and we can learn these other things we need to learn. We can learn how to be, respond to authority. It, 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 can make, it can develop that internal discipline in us so that we can be the kind of people we need to be in this society. And girls need that more than as much as uh, boys. I know that with my daughters. I know that. I know they long for their daddy's acceptance in life. Okay, so... Let's go down this road. So Paul is going down to Saul, is going down this road, and he meets Jesus. You see, you've got to meet Jesus. You've got to meet Jesus. He struck down, and the conversation could have went something like this. You heard it there. But it's not what, you, what is said, it's what you hear. And it could have went like this. Saul, after he was struck down in the dirt, and he's down in the dirt, he hears this voice. This voice says, Saul, Saul, I love you. I love you. Why you don't love me? Why you don't love me? He's going to explain that in Philippians later on. He's going to say on that Damascus road, God apprehended me. God put his strong arms around me, and he bound my arms with his love. He squeezed me. And on that road, he loved me. He said, I'm living the rest of my life now trying to repeat that love again, that, that I may know him the way he knew me on that road. I would like to reach out to him and catch him and squeeze him the way he squeezed me on that road. He loved me. That's what it means to be converted, is to discover that God loves us. God loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for us. So on this master's road, you meet Jesus Christ. On this master's road, he shows you his love. On the master's road, he opens your blinded eyes. On the master's road, he tells us what we are to do. And on the master's road, he tells us 
that we need somebody else in our life. You will not know all that needs to be known until you get to Jerusalem and Ananias and the church is going to come around you get to Damascus and Ananias and the church is going to come around you and nurture you. There ain't no long range of Christianity. You're born into a family, into a family. That's what happened on the Damascus Road. That's the first road. Make certain you're on that road. A lot of folks are trying to do community development uh, without being on, having been on that Damascus Road. It looked like it's good. It'll even look like it might get some faith-based money. <laughs> you, 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 you know, and so you want to put together your 501c3, and you're going to get some of that money too. You understand? To go along with this money you already got. And, 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 and Christ might, might not be as a part of this. We ain't just talking about programmatic stuff. We're talking about programmatic stuff, yes, 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 to meet the needs of Christ as we walk, walk out with compassion and to show the love of God through our good works that we're doing out there in the community. These are not tack-ons. And so on the Damascus Road, you, you meet Jesus. Have you met Jesus? Have you had a vision? You need to be on that road. Second road. Second road. The second road is the Emmaus Road. The Emmaus Road. And what is the Emmaus Road? The Emmaus Road is the road of discipleship. You come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. You know, today you say, what are you? I'm a Christian. What do that mean? I'm, I said, and I didn't want to be offensive at all. You don't take something and put a label on it and make it Christian. That's what I was trying to say about rap. <laughs> I ain't against rap. I'm not against the blues. I love the blues. You should hear me sing it. That's the only thing I can sing is the blues. <laughs> you ought to hear me sing the blues. You got me way down here. <laughs> you got me way down here about roll and fall. You treat me like a dog, baby, please. <laughs> I can sing the blues. I don't, I don't call the blues Christian. It is the blues. I don't take something and tack God onto it. God has got to be at the center of it. What we are doing. And so, let's go down to Samaria's road. This is the road of discipleship. This is the great day. If there any time I would have liked to have been with Jesus during the time he was here, this is when I would have liked to have been with him. It's, it's that first so-called Easter Sunday, the Resurrection Sunday. It, it's late in the afternoon, and these disciples have been with Jesus during the three years he's been on the earth or more. But they've given up. They've given up. They was out there on that hill that evening, and they watched the soldier pierce his side. They watched blood and water come out. They were somewhere near around when Nicodemus and Joseph Roman Fields took him and took him to the tomb, and they watched him as they wrapped him up and made a mummy out of him. Made a mummy out of him. They looked at him. He was dead. He was dead. He was dead. They watched the soldiers that they put the seal the tomb and put guards on it. And they was hid out the next three days in a room, praying, praying, trying to figure out what to do next, what to do next, what to do next. Early that morning, some ladies left and went down. After the third day, they went down there going to anoint his body so they could, he could be precious longer, precious longer. Their Savior was gone. And they went down there. You know, they went down there early that morning. They got there. Here the rose. The, the door was open. And, and uh, Jesus uh, uh, spoke to one of them there, had a little conversation with him. And, of course, I... Uh, these women then hurried up then and went back to tell the apostles who was hid out in the room what was going on. And, and, and then the apostles themselves began to go down there to the, to the tomb. 
And of course, they, what these men heard that was there, they heard this woman say, we saw a haint, a booger man, or something. <laughs> All day long, we've been hearing these rumors. Well, Jesus is dead. Jesus is dead. And I'm, we're going home. It's over with. It's over with. And boy, it's hard now. You're talking about lonely and sad. What they're talking about is what they would have hoped happened in their disappointment in Jesus. They're going back. It, my, my friends back home told us we shouldn't have left Father that guy anyway. You left your home, you left your children, your farm has grown up and all that kind of stuff, and, and, and you spent three and a half years following this guy. It, it, so we going home to face the music. It's over. Eula, that's when Jesus meets us. Jesus, Eula, meets us in pain. I have not met anybody yet who found Jesus because they were so rich. Even with their richness, something happened in their life. It caused them to think about Jesus. You meet Jesus in pain. Amen. Amen. Down that, around that road, they met Jesus. And I like Jesus. I, I like Jesus. I, I you know, I like Jesus a lot of reasons, I li but I like him because he was funny. <laughs> uh, I like him. I like to tell jokes. My wife don't like to hear my jokes, uh, but, but, but I like to tell jokes. I like to tell jokes. Jesus was a joke teller. I mean, he was a parable giver. I mean, you were all his, boy, when you were around Jesus, he was illustrating everything. You enjoyed being around Jesus. That's why disciples loved him so much, you know, around Jesus. And so he meets them, and he cracks a joke on them. He said, uh, why are you guys so lonely? What all this foolish y'all talking about? They said, uh, what do you mean? We talking about Jesus. Uh, we, he, we thought he was the son of God. And we followed him. We left our field. And all that. You must have been living in the moon. You haven't heard about Jesus? <laughs> Everybody heard about Jesus. What is wrong with you? They said. <laughs> And, 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 and Jesus then takes him into his arms. And the Bible says he began to, he started at Moses. That would be Genesis. And he went all the way through the Psalms and the prophets. And he opened up their understanding. That's the day I would like to be with Jesus. Jesus opened their understanding. You know, I love this road, walking with Jesus. This is what disciples should have loved. Walking with Jesus, but not walking alone. There got to be somebody else in your life. You got to have somebody else in your life. If you don't have nobody in your life, you are not going to do well. You are not going to do well in your life. And so he walked. We're going to hear that. I love this song. He walks with me. This is on the, this is on the male's row. I come to the garden alone. While the dew is still on the roses. And he walks with me. And he talks to me. And if he tells me that I am his own. And the joy you share as he lingers there, no other has ever known. Are you only a mayor's rose? Are you into the Bible? Are you hearing the voice of Jesus on that road? And I like it. When Jesus gets to the end of the road, I like Jesus. I mean, I like Jesus. He pulls another joke on him. The Bible says very plainly, it said he acted as pretended like he was going, going down the road. But look at here. Once you have really been walking with Jesus, you want to walk with him on. You don't want Jesus to leave you. And so those disciples invited him into his home. And y'all know what happened. He began to break the bread. And that bread still is symbolic of the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mind. He began to break the word of God. And then they realized that it was Jesus. And he disappeared out of their sight. That's the Emmaus road. Are you in discipleship? Do you have somebody? I have somebody. I, I got a discipleship house. And I even got people in my discipleship house can't get up to go to the discipleship house. Can't get up to be discipled. Call themselves Christians. 
And I read the Psalms 1 to them and told them how they could be really successful. I mean, you bet Psalm 1 is how to be successful. And these guys want to be successful. And some said it very easy. He said, don't fool around with sinners and all that kind of stuff. Don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Don't mock God. He said, make your delight in the Lord, the Lord, and in it you meditate day and night. He said, you'll be like a tree planted by the river of water that brings forth fruits in its season. Your leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever you do, you'll have success. That is a recipe for success. And somebody said, I don't want that. It's insane to me. It's a form of insanity. You know what insanity is? It's to have the power to do something and don't do it. That's what insanity is. Did y'all see Amazing Grace? Did you hear when Wilberford is now got everybody ready? They're ready to pass the bill to eliminate slavery in the British Empire. And uh, what is it? Stone, what's the name? The Prime Minister. Gladstone. Gladstone had this vision he was going to die, and he was going to die, and he wanted to do it before he died. He wanted to do it before he died. And you remember, Wilberforce said, but, 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 we can't do it uh, until the, what about the king? What about the king? He said, don't worry about the king. The king is insane. <laughs> the king is insane because the king got the power to do it but don't have the more stamina to do it. That's a recipe for insanity. That's a recipe for insanity in the world, to have the power to do something, but don't come up with the moral will to make a decision in life. And so on this Emmaus road, you get into discipleship. You're not walking alone. I like it because Jesus is walking with us. No, last one, and I'm finished. Third road. Third road is a Jericho road. The Jericho road is an altogether comprehensiveness of what the Christian is supposed to be about. It's comprehensive. Jesus says, go and do likewise. Jesus says, this fulfilled all the law and the prophets. When you get on this Jericho road, y'all know the story. A wonderful Jew was on the Jericho road. He got robbed, knocked in the head, left by the walk, well, half dead. And the religious people came along, and the religion ain't quite good enough. Religion ain't quite good enough. The Levite came along. I mean, the pastor came along, the priest. He was going to have an anniversary at his church, and he had to get on, and he ain't got no time for nobody else on the roadside. And I'm half day having my pastor's anniversary. That's what they're having, and I ain't going to have no time for you. <laughs> the Levite was a Sunday school teacher, and he came along there. Uh, he looked up on him, and he said, I'm late for my flight. Not only that, but he's bleeding. He might have AIDS, and he might condemn. And so I don't have time for that guy. But this old Samaritan who had Jesus in his life and Jesus in his heart had God in his life. Look what happened. He sees him and he gets compassion. Get compassion. Gets compassion. He goes to him. He bound up his wound. He gave him wine to drink. He probably put wine on his sores and all that. He took out his bomb, his medicine kit, and he took care of the guy. He used it all up on him. And then he put him on his own donkey and carried him into town. He didn't start no 501c3. <laughs> he didn't wait for that. Too late to take too long to do that. <laughs> he had to use up his own resources first. First. He invested his own resources into it and took care of it. Turn on. And he was committed to his future. He was committed to his future. He had to go on a journey. But he calls a host of the hotel up and said, look, 
put this on my American Express. Put this on my American Express, and I'd take care of everything if he ordered more. He was committed to it. That's the Jericho Road. That's us. That's CCDA. Let's stay on this road together. I don't care what church you're from. I'm, when I see the Salvation Army people here with me, I always, always uh, feel good. And everywhere we go, the Salvation Army, I'm, I'm talking for all of y'all, but I, I just point out the Salvation Army because they have had such a, they will bond out of what we are talking about here. They will bond out there rescuing the perishing, caring for the blind, snatching them in pity from sin in the grave. That's what they're about. That's what they've been about. And they are joining with us. And we all of are joining with us. We ain't forming another church. We believe in the universality of Christ's body. And wherever you're at, gathering together in his name, you constitute the church, and we want to be a part of what you're doing, and you're welcome to CCDA. You're welcome to CCDA. Let's pray. Let's pray. Remember these three roads when we finish. First road is the road of conversion, the master's road. Keep that in your mind. The second row is the Emmaus row, row of discipleship. The third row is the road he called us to get on and stay on, and that's the Jericho road. Rescuing the perishing, caring for the dying, snatching them in pity from sin and the grave. Father, thank you for this host of people. I pray that you would bless us and bless the remainder of our time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.